The talk today uh, is about our recent work on the interactive design of convolutional neural networks for medical image analysis. In, in the agenda, I will cover the following topics. First, um, why should we involve artificial intelligence and medical experts in the machine learning loop? So this is uh, a problem that I have been concerned for a while now. And then I will talk about our strategy and research goal toward this, uh, in this research topic and go to the method that I'm going to present today. It's a very recent approach that we developed to estimate uh, convolutional neural network filters uh, with no bad propagation and using only a very few uh, annotated images. So the, the purpose here is to minimize user involvement in data annotation, especially uh, to design the feature extraction uh, module of convolutional neural networks. And I will finish this talk by presenting examples of uh, medical image analysis application. First, uh, <laughs> why should we involve experts in the machine learning loop? We all know that uh, humans, experts, they, they need to transfer knowledge to machines for the learning process. And we want to do that with minimal human effort, especially in, in areas that require uh, expertise, like medicine, for example, or biology. So I have, uh, during the talk, you're going to see some links like this one to papers that, uh, provide some support to what I'm saying. And I, I intend to, to make available the PDF of the talk in the home page, at the homepage of the conference so you can follow those links and identify the papers. So this first paper provides you examples uh, of how can human uh, effort be minimized during the annotation process. So basically it shows an uh, application that used the latent space of a network uh, project that space, uh, feature space into uh, 2D. And then humans, the human and, and uh, same supervised uh, algorithm, they together label the, the images uh, for, <coughs> so do the supervision, human does the supervision and the same supervisor uh, classifier annotates uh, the images, uh, the classifier has more confidence. And in this process, uh, it was possible, for example, to reduce to 3% only the, the human effort in, in data annotation in the training set. Well, we also would like to understand what's going on. So we want the, the user to understand and intervene in the machine learning process. And there are two important tasks uh, involved in this case, for example. One is when you construct the, 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 the convolutional neural network. So, and also when you already have a convolutional neural network, but you want to simplify its architecture, right? So we have here also links to examples uh, to both uh, activities. And uh, the talk will be concentrated on this one, the first one, the construction of feature extractors. Third, uh, we also would like to release the machine uh, for, for being tested only when we think the machine is ready, right? When uh, we think that uh, the learning process has been completed. So we want to be able to explain the decisions, the pros and cons of the, the solution that we are providing. And this example shows clearly uh, a situation where the machine is not ready to be tested, for example. On the left, you, you can see a chest X-ray uh, of a patient with pneumonia, and the pneumonia is indicated by these white bounding boxes. Uh, but uh, on the right, you see that the decision of the machine from blue to red uh, has been influenced from blue to red based on this region. So the red region means that the region that contributed most uh, for the decision of the machine. And you can see that although the decision was correct, pneumonia, 
it was not based on the pneumonia itself, but based on something else that the machine found in the image, right? Okay, given that uh, our strategy has been to exploit the complementary skills of humans in knowledge abstraction and machines in data processing. So you can think of that as a synergistic process in which uh, you, uh, the, the humans can provide some action and uh, action, and then the machine provides uh, does some processing, extracts information, presents that uh, if extra information to the human, and then the human can, uh, based on that information, be guided to select the next action. Right? And in this sense, <laughs> you can have, for example, the human as the center of the process interacting with a classifier, interacting with a decoder, or interacting with a feature extractor. So the pipeline uh, that takes the image, extracts features, and, and classifies uh, is, has been usually used for object detection identification. And the pipeline that extracts uh, features for the decoder uh, are usually, is usually used for object uh, segmentation, right? So uh, the idea here is that the human might be able to interact with any of these three. Uh, and as uh, the interaction proceeds, it's possible, for example, to use the, the results of the interaction with the classifier also to improve the feature structure. But I'm going to talk here only about how uh, it works, the interaction between a human and the feature extractor for uh, improving the quality of the feature space. So the goal in any of these cases uh, is the same, is to build reliable image-based decision-making systems. So the object of this talk uh, is then to, to explain how we uh, explore uh, human knowledge to estimate convolutional neural network filters with no back propagation and using very few annotated images. Uh, why I'm concerned of not using back propagation? Because we know that back propagation uh, has, uh, brings many interesting uh, problems actually <laughs> for deep learning. As, deep is the, as deeper is the network, then uh, you have many problems that appear with back propagation, for example, that uh, makes it difficult to to, to fix or to, to improve the, the, the parameters of the filters in the first layers, for example. So in our approach here, uh, the, the user will interact with a sequence of convolutional layers. So, so the idea, the feature structure is represented by a sequence of convolutional layers. I will tell soon uh, what's the content of each convolutional layer, but imagine that you have a sequence of convolutional layer which essentially transform the feature space of the input images into another feature space and again and again. So this feature space can, uh, can be uh, think, thought of as uh, the global feature space, the feature space that you, that you get when you concatenate the output of each filter in the convolutional layer as a single feature vector, right? And the idea of this process is actually to map images from different classes into different subspaces of this global feature space. So if you manage to do that, the classifier will not have any problem in separating the classes, right? And I will be presenting an example uh, of parasite classification uh, and another two examples of uh, ground glass segmentation and glioblastoma segmentation. So in the first example, I will be using the microscopy images, optical microscopy images in this uh, ground glass segmentation from uh, CT images of the thorax and the glioblastoma segmentation from MR images of the brain. Okay, the method, we call the method of FLIN. Uh, it stands for uh, feature learning from image markers. It has been presented for uh, remote sense image classification. This was the first publication. And then we presented in, in, in a workshop for uh, the WIPS uh, natural uh, an applica application for some natural image classification. And uh, also in an workshop in Brazil 
uh, as a conference in Brazil, we presented the uh, approach for object delineation. Okay, the filters uh, are obtained for, uh, from strokes that the, the user draws uh, in training images, and those strokes are drawn on regions that the user think, uh, understands are important to separate, to distinguish the classes. So uh, our experience shows that uh, the user only needs to draw strokes on one to three images per class, but this is still a develop, under developing uh, technology. So we don't know exactly <laughs> if this would be enough or not. So probably I have observed that uh, depending on the image that you select to draw strokes, you can get a uh, much better results. Uh, uh, you can get more effective results, right? So the image selection is an important issue here. But let's suppose that you take this representative image per class, you draw markers on regions that you believe are important to distinguish the class. So why you do that? Because you want to extract, to learn the filters from those markers, uh, filters that will be able to, when you do the convolution uh, between the image and the filter, those marked regions should be enhanced in the output. In other words, if you consider uh, the borders of uh, an object are important for the classification and you draw a marker, uh, outline the border of that object, that border, at least in the first layer, should be enhanced, right? And this is possible, <clears throat> this, is, this can be understood by this second example here, because <laughs> as you see, we extract patches from the marker pixels with the same shape of the filters. We compute some normalization clustering of those patches. So in the, the patch feature space, uh, which is a local feature space, and we take the center of these clusters as the filters. So you can imagine that if you do the convolution uh, between this image and a filter, which is the, the center of a cluster here, for example, it means what? It means that the, the convolution will be, uh, it's a, you can think of the convolution as an inner product, right? Between the, the vector uh, that represents the weight of the filters and the vector that represents the patch features. So that inner product will be higher uh, between patches uh, that are in the same cluster, right? And the convolution with that filter then will, uh, will be higher, right? Uh, if the patch is inside that, the cluster of that filter and the rectified linear unit operation, the activation, you essentially select those regions uh, in the output image. So those regions will be activated. But let's suppose that you patch uh, that is in the opposite side of that cluster then it means what? You can think of the, the filter as a vector orthonormal to a hyperplane, and that patch will be in the negative side of the hyperplane. So the convolution will be negative, and then the rectified linear unit uh, activation function will eliminate uh, the regions that are represented by the patch in the negative side of the hyperplane, right? So by doing that, you are actually separating the image into several bands. In this case, if I have uh, five clusters, I will have five filters, right? And in these new five bands, uh, uh, each band will en uh, show enhanced only uh, regions of the image that are very close uh, uh, in the same cluster of the corresponding filter. We also make the filters of each cluster uh, with unit norm, because we don't want to have a preference among filters, right, uh, in between them, one filter over the other. Okay, this uh, illustrates better what I, I just said. Suppose that you have two classes and three clusters here. And if you consider uh, the center of each cluster as a filter, right, when you do the centralization of the clusters, if you compute the winner product uh, of this, elements with this filter, this one, and this one, you gain, you're going to get a new feature space 
with three dimensions because you have three fields, right? And as you can see, the classes are now mapped into different subspace. At least that's the idea. So most of the samples in the purple class are, uh, are mapped, they, they are mapped into this 2D space here, and the yellow class is mapped into this 1D space here. So if you manage to do that, it means what? That you can separate the class very easily uh, with a single hyperplane. And uh, I actually, I have also, I mean, it's possible to use the technology that I'm presenting here with a multi layer perception as a classifier, but it's also possible to use it with a support vector machine, as I'm going to show in this talk. And uh, in this case, I do not use back propagation at all, right? Because I do not even use back propagation to train the, the classifier. Okay, each convolutional layer consists of uh, operations like the marker based normalization, which is important uh, to do the centralization of the clusters and and to distribute them surrounding the origin of the system, the local patch uh, feature space system. And that mark uh, based normalization is equivalent to uh, Z score normalization. So it's like a batch normalization, but we are using here uh, the mean and standard deviation of uh, the elements in the markers only, right? Then it's uh, once you do that centralization, complete the convolution the rectified linear unit operation uh, just selects the, the enhanced region, the, 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 the patches that are in the regions that are in the positive side of the hyperplane. And then you can also have pooling to aggregate activation, right? So now the feature extractor consists of a sequence of convolutional layers, each convolutional layer having, let's say these four operations and the user uh, draws markers only at the input layer, because the user just sees the image in the input layers. It's a natural image for, for, for that user, so it's easy to, to identify the regions which are important for the problem. So how do I compute the, 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 the filters for the subsequent layers? So basically, for the first layer, you use the marker pixels uh, of the input images. And then once the filters are computed, you generate the, 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 the result of this layer, the first layer, and then you repeat the process by projecting the markers onto the output of the first layer to compute the features of the second layer. For that projection, when I'm designing the network, I set the stride of the pooling to one, usually, just to not lose resolution, to not lose markers, because those markers will be automatically projected uh, uh, onto the, the output of each uh, convolutional layer for the training of the next layer, right? But once the architecture, is, uh, the, the filters are found in each layer, then I set the, the strides of the pooling uh, <clears throat> to numbers greater than one, for example, if I want to do classification. For segmentation, I usually fix those strides in at one, okay? So here is one example. Suppose that you have a data set with lava and impurities in microscopy images. So you know the, the important parts that characterize the lava are the borders, right? And actually borders are usually very interesting uh, regions to, to, to draw markers. They are usually very effective. So the user essentially draws these blue lines uh, to indicate uh, borders of lava. And if you have an impurity like this one, you might draw also lines that uh, lava will never have. For example, those vertical lines uh, do not appear in any lava, right? So this is just a, uh, an impurity uh, example. The impurities actually, they represent a very large and diverse class in microscopy images. So they might be similar to lava, right? Like this example, this one, or even this one, but they do not have those well-defined boundaries that I presented before, right? It's also possible that this is a lava that has been destroyed by the, the, the processing, but it has been classified uh, by our experts as uh, impurity, okay? <laughs> okay, once you do that, draw the markers, the network finds the filters automatically, 
Uh, so of course I have to provide the architecture. So in this case, I provide an architecture with three layers. The first layer with 64 filters, second layer with uh, 256, the third layer with 512. And I use only six images to create this result here. So I connected the Flynn with a support vector machine. So Flynn was trained with six images, but of course support vector machine was trained with 30% uh, of the data set. And I compared this result with the result of several classical networks. They have been pre-trained on ImageNet and fine-tuned on our Lava data set with the same 30% uh, examples that are uh, used to train this support vector machine classifier. And as you can see on the right here, the, uh, I, I highlight in red here, the situations that uh, perform worse than our approach, right? Of course, our approach was not better than uh, VGG 16, VGG 19, if you take into account accuracy. But because this is unbalanced data set, I usually prefer to take into consideration Kappa. And in terms of Kappa, uh, we actually were very competitive with VGG 19 also, right? So of course, I believe that it's possible to achieve similar competitive results or even better than GGG, but I did not uh, put too much effort in doing that yet. And uh, this is just to, to show to you that the idea is quite powerful and, and provide very impressive results, even when it, you compare it with uh, very traditional uh, uh, networks, right? Okay, for, for ground glass segmentation, the issue is different. So you just place markers to indicate the ground glass that uh, texture that appears in patients with COVID-19. And we, with white markers, you, you might indicate the parenchyma. Okay, in here, I'm not using the label of the markers they, uh, to train flame, but uh, I can use the label of the markers to create a decoder. And that's exactly what I do here. I create a decoder uh, by weighting the filters that better uh, respond for, for the uh, ground glass uh, texture. And if this shows the result uh, of segmentation for, for, for that image that I, I, I use for the training, and I'm using here just a single image for training, and um, and uh, a network which consists only of 32 three by three by three filters, the encoder and the decoder is a single layer decoder. And, and if I use that network to classify new image, I get the results that I'm showing here. This one and this one, right? So you see a good separation between the pattern and the, the other regions, but also, <laughs> of course, there are some false positives also. And, this also raises a question that what happens if you draw markers in multiple images? In this case, at each convolutional layer, you should be able to find a consensus network. So you just merge by clustering also, you can merge the filters of it that are uh, derived from each image into a single uh, set of filters for that convolutional layer, and then repeat that for the second, third, and so on, okay? For the glioblastoma segmentation, you have usually uh, T1 uh, images uh, with gadolinium that are good to, to show the enhanced tumor and the necrotic regions that I see here in red, the necrotic region, the enhanced tumor in blue. And, but the edema, the, this part in green, uh, is actually better salt uh, in the T2 flare. So basically, we are also going to use a similar network, 32 filters, and a single layer decoder. And so the, the user place markers, uh, blue markers in the enhanced region of the tumor, yellow markers in the necrotic region, and white markers in the background uh, in the T1 GD images. But in T2 flare, the user might place, for example, yellow markers to indicate the whole tumor, and white marks to indicate the background. So we, this creates actually two decoders, one decoder for the MRT1 and another decoder for the MRT2 flag. 
And this shows uh, the result of that decoder uh, when you do, and of course you have the, the, the result of the decoder and you need some post-processing, of course, some image processes required here to combine these results and into a single image. So of course you miss some parts that in the Nicolat region, which are very difficult to be detected, but, uh, and have some false positive also, but this uh, is an impressive result if you consider that I'm using only a single image for, to train the fling uh, structure, right? And if I use that uh, network in the other two images, I get this result here, okay? Which are very close to the, the ground truth results. Okay, in conclusion, we might say that uh, Flynn has shown competitive and superior results in several applications with considerably reduced human effort in image annotation. By providing lightweight, experimental, and widely supervised CNNs, I think Flynn overcomes some limitations that we find in deep learning for medical image analysis. And I think Flynn provide, uh, provides also a very good opportunity for research because there are many issues that need to be better working on, like uh, label information from the markers to uh, clustering technique, training, uh, which image you're going to select for training, where you're going to select the markers in those images, uh, how can you combine filters from multiple training images, and so on. So I would like to thank you for the attention, and this concludes the talk. <laughs>